Hello, it's me, Kyle. Welcome back to Give Paws Hobby. We are back with another root bot. Roar. Uh, we have the logical lizards, um, which I will say, I, I noticed this last night when I was showing uh, off to my wife that how adorable this is. This is one that is uh, pretty clearly electrical, which is, um, I don't know, it's kind of breaking the theme of uh, non-electric sort of the cogwheel and clockwork and all that sort of stuff. But it is what it is. It's still adorable. And it's a really fun faction to play. So let's learn about it. Um, again, reminders, this is uh, a continuation. This is a series. It's not, well, I mean, it is a series, but you really only need to listen to or watch the one video before whatever faction you want to learn about, and that is the zeroth episode. So somewhere in the corners is going to be the link. If you have not seen this, this is the Law of Rootbotics Teach, um, just to make sure that you know everything you need to know about the factions uh, writ large before I teach you about any given faction specifically. So if you haven't seen that, Go take a look at it uh, and then come on back here. As with all of them, turn on the Klingon subtitles. I'm going to do my absolute best to make sure that there aren't mistakes in here. If there are small mistakes, I will definitely make or, or oversights, um, things I just didn't make clear enough. I will put those at the top of the description. Uh, if it's something that really should be like, yeah, I, I misspoke or I, I said something out of order or whatever. Um, I'll put it in the Klingon subtitles. I don't know how to use those yet, but I will learn. Um, if it's something that's like bad enough that it's really, really an issue, I will go back and we'll do another pass. Um, it might be like a, I think this is episode seven. Uh, it might be like a 7.1, <laughs> the thing I missed. Um, so, uh, or if it's really, really bad, I will just, take down the old video and make a new one. Um, hopefully that doesn't have to happen. Um, but yeah, let's uh, talk about the Logical Lizards. First of all, Logical Lizards, um, as a name, I mean, alliteration is good. Uh, it makes sense. It is in on, on you know, uh, theme with uh, mechanical and programming and that sort of stuff. However, having played a number of games against them, they don't always make the most logical plays. So, I mean, that's part of the charm of the clockwork fa uh, factions, at least to me. It's not like you're, you're, you're not playing Deep Blue um, or Alpha Go or whatever. This is going to be sometimes uh, a game that's really evenly matched, you and the, and the bots. Sometimes it's going to be very lopsided. The bots just get some really awesome draws um, and the game kind of gets away from you. Other times they're going to make weird, quirky plays and that's just part of the fun. So Logical Lizards might be a bit of a stretch, but it's a pretty good name. Um, in terms of the overview, let's see. The Lizards will convert all unbelievers to their cause, whether they're willing or not. Keep an eye on their lost souls and prepare for a flood of warriors if you see lots of cards matching the clearings you're in. Try to hurt them whenever possible by removing their gardens and watch out if you give them too many acolytes. So these are all solid uh, recommendations for any uh, lizard player, which again, I say this pretty often. One thing I do re really like about the Clockwork expansion, yes, they are quirky, but they still stay, you know, they hew close enough to the regular version of these factions that a lot of the strategies you might use for one are going to be beneficial for the other. Um, making sure you limit the number of acolytes you give a Lizards player. Uh, remembering what's in the Lost Souls, or in this case you can just see it. Um, that's a, a super handy thing to do too. Um, but in any case, solid overview, good things to keep in mind. Let's actually get to the board. So up top, we have our berries, two of which are the ones that uh, fans of the series will know by heart by now, which is poor manual dexterity and hate surprises. So again, look at that zeroth episode. I go into detail about those. Um, you're going to need to know them. The next two, uh, Pilgrims and Robot Revenge, are uh, the two variations, the other flavors that the berries can be. The first flavor is the almost uniform uh, poor manual dexterity and hate surprises. Second flavor is when it's the same as the players, which is to say pilgrims. 
you rule clearings that have a garden. That is the exact same rule as the player uh, lizard cult. Um, so they have the same rule, pilgrims. The third flavor is when it's somewhere in between. It's not entirely robot specific, like poor manual dexterity and hate surprises. And it is not the exact same as the player version, but it is a hybrid. And uh, instead of just revenge, it is called robot revenge. So whenever any lizard warriors are removed outside of your turn, place one of them in your acolytes box. So you'll remember, those, for those who have played the lizards, revenge, anytime your lizard, defending lizards are removed, they all go to the acolytes box. So they only go become acolytes if they're lost in combat, um, but they do all go to your acolytes box. Now this, it, it, I got good news and I got bad news. The good news is anytime a lizard is re removed for any purpose, it qualifies for robot revenge. The bad news is no matter how many lizards are lost, only one will ever go to the acolytes box. So again, very, uh, it's a variation on the theme. So that means it's not the same name because it's not the same rule, but it is very much the same idea. And that's, that's how that works. So another rule that's not part of the berries is going to be down at the gardens. Um, and that is a uh, just an italicized statement down there. It says, when a garden is removed from the map, discard the top card in your lost souls. Um, so that's important to remember. It's the same kind of curse as the rules at the bottom of the alliance and the automated alliance. Early morning recording. Um, but it, uh, which is to say it's an important rule to remember for balancing purposes like uh, just that's how this is supposed to run but it's easy to overlook because of its placement on the board so keep that in mind anytime a garden I mean it makes sense the rule is right where the gardens go so if you're in the habit of reading what's on the board by where you're putting pieces you should be good because um, when you put a garden back you say uh oh did that come from the map Probably, and if it did, womp womp, you lose a lost soul card. So that's the berries of the faction. Let's set them up. On the back of the new board, we have our five-step setup process. So first, you're going to gather your warriors, a supply of 25 of those cute little lizards. Second, you're going to place them. You're going to place four warriors and one garden of matching printed suit in a random corner clearing that's not the starting corner clearing of another bot and if possible diagonally opposite from a starting corner and clearing. So you're going to be in corner clearing and ideally it'll be opposite from any other faction uh, with four lizards in that clearing and a garden and then one warrior in each adjacent clearing. Set conspiracy. Place the outcast marker on the sanctify space of the conspiracy track on your faction board. Fill the garden tracks. Uh, place your 14 remaining gardens from right to left. Uh, so you have that one that's on the map already. And then draw lost souls. Draw three cards and place them face up in your lost souls in the order drawn to kind of prime the pump, so to speak. All right, so that's set up. So let's move into birdsong. Now, when you look at this board, you're going to realize, gasp, this is different from what they normally are. This is one of two factions um, that are different from the first two steps that everybody else has. Everyone else has draw an order card, craft it if possible. You don't see either of those in Birdsong. Instead, your first step, you're going to check your lost souls to see uh, what is the most common suit in the pile. That is your order. If there's a tie, the order is bird. Um, so it can still be bird, if you know you have four bird, three fox, and one of each of the other two, then bird it is. But if you have three bird, three fox, and one of each of the other, or three rabbit and three mouse, then the order is still bird. Now, importantly, you do not change the order of the cards. So if your brain is like mine, you will want when you fan those cards out, you're going to want to consolidate suits with other cards of that suit. Don't do that. They need to be all mixed up in whatever order they came into the Lost Souls. That's important later on. Second, perform conspiracies. So now that you know what the order is, if you have acolytes in the acolytes box, you're going to perform those conspiracies. So let's move over and talk about that. When you're performing conspiracies, if you have any acolytes, 
Um, you don't at the beginning of the game, pro tip. Move the conspiracy marker once to the right and wrapping to the leftmost base if you move off Sanctify. You're going to perform the conspiracy of the covered space that you just moved on to if possible. And if you completed the conspiracy, you will remove an acolyte. Only if you actually did the conspiracy. And you're going to return to the start of this box, continue until you have no acolytes or you've reached an endless loop. There is the possibility, um, actually it's a pretty strong likelihood that at, at least once per game, you're gonna get to a point where you will have more acolytes, but because of the way conspiracies are targeted or due to the, the realities of the board state that it is, if you keep going, you're just going to keep looping and looping and looping. You might never spend those last couple acolytes. So uh, what I usually do is just kind of make a mental note what the first conspiracy was that I could not do, like there wasn't a valid target, and then keep going. If there's another uh, conspiracy that happens after that, then I kind of overwrite that, that memory of what was the first invalid conspiracy. Sort of like betting in poker. Once you've gone all the way around, then you see. But if one person bets, then you can raise it. I think. I don't really know how to play poker, but I think that's how it works. Um, so if, for instance, you start on Sanctify, you're doing things, doing things, doing things, and Sanctify is the first one that you have no valid target for, but you still have Acolytes, you're going to go back over here and if no other Crusades or Converts have valid targets, but you still have Acolytes, when you get back to Sanctify, I just leave it there because that was the first, you know, endless loop point. So that's where it ends. Otherwise, it's just going to keep going and you'll never be able to play the game. So that's that. All right, so we talked about conspiracies. Let's actually talk about them themselves. So further off to the side, you'll notice this, this board is very full. Some of the factions have extra real estate. They can just put artwork on here. The lizards and the otters are not in that category. Um, so at the top of the conspiracies box in bold and italics, it says determine target player first, then target clearing. Super important. It applies to all three, um, uh, well, it actually only applies to two of them. <laughs> we'll get to that. But it's super important because uh, your target player is always going to be player with the most points. You are shooting for the game leader. So there will be times when the, the lizards will have valid targets if they would be allowed to attack someone who is not the game leader. But that's not the way this is written. So you always need to be taking that into account. Target player first, and then you look for target clearing. So first up, convert. In an ordered clearing, which we found out from our outcast thing at the beginning of Birdsong, replace an enemy warrior with a lizard warrior. So player tie, the thing you can do first, player with the most points, the game leader. Um, if there's a tie, it's setup order. Clearing tie, clearing with the most enemy buildings. So you want to be contesting uh, those enemy buildings by either dropping a garden into those open building slots or sanctifying those buildings later on. So um, again, game leader and then clearing tie, clearing with most enemy buildings. Crusade, battle in each ordered clearing that you have two or more lizards. So this is, uh, this is the one where you don't necessarily need to, actually you won't, uh, target player first before anything else because all the ordered clearings. So if it's a fox card or fox uh, order, all your fox clearings. If it's a bird order, all clearings that you have two or more lizards, you will battle in. So you just go from first priority to last. And in each of those clearings, you're going to target the player who has the most points there. So it will be different or it could be different for each of those clearings as you battle them. It could be that the player with the most points is everywhere. The cats player could be the one with the most points and they could be all over the map, in which case the cats are going to take a lot of beating in all these crusade battles. Um, but you will reassess for each clearing you fight. It's not like a one at the top and then they're all the same after that. And then lastly, the scariest of the uh, conspiracies, Sanctify. In an ordered clearing, replace an enemy building with a matching garden. 
Player tie, player with the most points. Clearing tie, clearings with the least enemy warriors. Now, a couple of things here. Um, well, first, importantly, it's the same rules as it was for conversion. You need to find the target player first and then find the target clearing. The second thing, follow-up, this may mean there are factions for whom this really doesn't affect very much. It might be someone who's playing small mole who doesn't have much in, in terms of buildings. They might be the, the points leader, and in that case, womp womp, you're not going to have many options for Sanctify. The points leader might be a vagabond or vagabot, in which case they have zero buildings to Sanctify. But if they're the points leader, they are the target player, which means you have to just kind of skate on past that Sanctify, which is dark, not just because that's where the, the token starts. That's probably why it's dark. It's dark because that's the scariest one. Um, at least I view it to be. So those are conspiracies. Next up, daylight. Um, rituals. It's the only thing that happens in daylight. So in terms of number of steps, the logical lizards are super easy, um, which is kind of like saying, uh, someone's like, oh, I have a really easy way to, to lose weight. It's just one thing. And you're like, oh, what's the one thing? And they're like, just eat healthy. And you're like, cool, 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 cool. So yeah, it's, it's very few steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, and some of those are things like discard loss, so like very easy ones. However, there's a decent amount of layers that go on in these steps. Um, for instance, in daylight, Rituals reveal the top four cards of your lost souls one at a time and perform a ritual for each. So you've already looked at this stack to see what was the outcast suit for what was your order card uh, or your order suit rather. You're going to go back to your conspiracies. You're going to get your four cards off the top and you're going to, in order, perform a ritual for each one. Now what I like to do for this is I turn the cards Hang on, let me get cards so I can show you. All right, so if this huge thing is my stack of lost souls, I'm going to get my four cards off the top and these ones underneath it are gonna go back to the lost souls pile. So we're gonna perform a ritual for each of these, but they need to maintain the order because they will go back in the lost souls in this order. So what I do is I flip it upside down and then when I turn it up, I perform the ritual and it goes to the back. Flip the next one, perform it, goes to the back, do it, do it, boom, we're back to the front. Now you're saying, but Kyle, that's simple. I could just remember what the first one was. You and me, we both know that. However, you and me also know Root is a game of lots of things going on up here. So any opportunity I have to lower the threshold for what I need to hold up in my old noodle, it's a good thing. So again, flip it upside down, turn them up to do the ritual, and send it to the back. You say, but Kyle, I don't know how to do those rituals. Well, good thing, we're gonna do it right now. Um, so if it is a fox, mouse, or rabbit card, um, like I just showed you, they're all going to work the same way. You're going to place a warrior in a matching clearing, then if you rule there, you're going to place a matching garden if there is an open slot for a building. Um, for clearing ties, if you draw a fox card for determining which fox clearing, place warrior in clearing with any open building slots, then the most enemy buildings. So you're, you want it to be in a, uh, a spot that has, or a clearing that has spots for your gardens, but you also want them to be contested clearings. You don't, they're not going to necessarily run and crowd towards clearings that uh, are wide open, that no one's paying attention to, to cram a bunch of gardens there. They're going to go to clearings where they're gonna clog up things, which I have talked with Benjamin Schmaus about this. It's not necessarily the absolute like pro strat play, um, but that's okay. That's it's it's instead I think much better. It's the play that's going to keep the game interest interesting, um, because root is most interesting when people are the most entangled. The factions are kind of intermingling like that, and by by saying yes, we want clearings with open building slots, but just beneath that 
we want them to be clearings that have enemy buildings in them instead of just like off alone by themselves like oftentimes the player faction lizards do uh, it makes for really interesting games um, if it's a bird card instead you're going to take a lizard warrior from the clearing with the most lizard warriors and place it in the acolytes box so oh i <laughs> thanks to editing magic i've already done my uh example turn for this there will be a, liz or a bird card in there i will have a disclaimer um because i took it from supply bird I'm going to just take a warrior from supply turn it into an acolyte and i did not take it from the clearing with the most lizards so that's on me it should when you see it, it it should have come from the lower right hand clearing um, i think that's two uh yeah i'll I'm just letting you know, be ready for it. Um, then you're gonna put this card in the discard pile, not Lost Souls. So the bird cards, they all go to the Lost Souls pile, but when you get to this step, they will cycle or filter out of Lost Souls. Once you spend it to make an Acolyte, it goes away. And that's Daylight. Again, it's only one thing, but you're doing it four times, and it's two different things depending on if it's a bird card or not. So then we go into evening. First up, scoring victory points of rightmost empty garden space. Super easy. Doesn't matter what the order is. The order is bird or rabbit or mouse. Whatever. You're just going to look for whichever is the, the furthest to the right uncovered space. So if I had three fox gardens on the board, but it was a mouse order uh, that turn and I only had one mouse garden, I would still score this one because this is going to give me two points. This is going to get me nothing. Um, so super simple first step. Second, discard lost souls. So um, this can be a little bit confusing because you have not returned your revealed cards yet. You may have naturally done it as, as you finished up here, but Root is not a game where we fill in rules with what we assume them to be. We do things very literally. So it did not tell you what to do with the revealed cards, so don't do anything with them yet. It's the cards you didn't reveal the bottom ones underneath those top four, those get wiped and they get sent to the actual discard pile because the next step, you're going to return those revealed cards to the top of the Lost Souls, preserving their previous order. So that whole thing we talked about where I turned it upside down and put it behind the pile, that's why we do that, to make sure they go in the order because like the overview said, the way that these are programmed there are methods that you can kind of anticipate what's going to happen. Um, it's the, the root bots are nothing if not random. However, logical lizards, I guess I'm coming around to this name. There is more logic in them than many other robots because you're not a root bots because you're not just drawing the order card. It is determined by what's in here and the order of the rich. Okay. I'm fully on board with the name now, logical lizards. It's alliteration and thematically tracks. Um, and then last up, finally, they get an opportunity to craft. You're going to craft the top card of the deck for one victory point if it shows an available item. Then add the reveal card to the Lost Souls um, rather than discard whether or not you craft it. So you will flip the top card. If it's an item that's available, craft it for one victory point. If not, no biggie. In either case, that gets slapped down on top of the Lost Souls. Um, where the rules there, whenever a card is spent or discarded, place it in this pile. So same rule set that the normal lizards have. Uh, I guess I should have said that earlier. But So those are the logical lizards. Um, I think there's a ton of fun uh, to play against and to, to watch them spin their gears. So speaking of that, let's go over to the table and I will show you an example turn as the logical lizards against a few other factions. So you can see them as they do their thing. Hello, welcome to the table. 
Um, so no, you don't need to adjust your screen. I did a slightly askew setup here. Um, I know one day when I actually have a top-down, like dedicated or halfway dedicated filming space, I will look at these videos and be like, what the hell was I doing? But um, I'm just uh, doing the best that I can <laughs> with the situation I've got. And I figured that I can get a little bit more sight lines on the player board if I tilt everything a little bit to the side. So sorry for anyone who this really bothers now that I've done the other six the other way. Um, here we are. But anyways, um, speaking of uh, new things, did this a little bit differently as well. I just played uh, almost two turns of one and a half like rounds um, of two bots and one player faction because we obviously do not have a bot yet for the uh, Lord of the Hundreds. So I just played that faction um, just to get a different color on the board uh, to demonstrate some different things. And this is the game state that we have. So we're going into... This is part of, uh, we're into round two. Um, we're finally getting back to the Lizard's second turn. So uh, I believe it was uh, the Alliance, Moles, um, Lizards, and then the Rats. So uh, here we are, and uh, we're going to go through the turn and show you how things work. Again, the Law of Robotics used to be set up a little bit differently where it would just tell me exactly what I needed to do. Um, but then it did this other one, which kind of in theory shows you <clears throat> some of the rules in motion, but these aren't necessarily an actual map setup as we've talked about before. Um, so I just come up with game states and show you a turn. Uh, I think, I actually don't know why I wasn't doing this at this this way before because it allows me to just kind of find a good spot that seems like it's going to show a lot of uh demonstrate a lot of different things um but anyways uh without me jabbering on anymore let's get to the turn so uh first off we are going to uh determine our outcasts so there's quite a few cards in here um and we have uh three birds three uh, rabbits and four foxes. So foxes are the outcast suit. Now, m my natural inclination is to do what just naturally happened here with the rabbits and consolidate the suits. But for those of you in the know, you know that that's no good because you need these top uh, cards to be in the order they are put into the lost souls. Um, so that's for your rituals part. So you got to count them without actually putting the like suits together because then you you mess that whole thing up so foxes or fox is our outcast suit which means you're going we're going to perform our conspiracies we have five acolytes we lost a decent amount of uh lizards last turn didn't make any on our own we just lost them um so uh with that let's let's get to let's get to the the actual turn so uh we move our outcast suit goes to convert and we are going to uh, convert turn this lizard or rather something into this lizard in an ordered clearing uh, replace an enemy warrior with a lizard warrior now this is super important you determine the target player then the target clearing so that means there will be times when because of the target player which is the player with the most points um, there are going to be times when you just won't target certain factions at all because you'll never say like, well, I'm targeting 12, so I guess I have to go against the rats. No, because right now you will always be targeting the moles, in which case you will uh, you will be only focusing on clearings where you can take the battle or the conversion to the moles. So in this case, um, we're looking for fox clearings with mole warriors, and that only happens here. So we're getting rid of a mole, we're replacing it with a lizard. Then we go on Crusade. So ordered clearings with two or more uh, lizards, that, that doesn't exist. So if you don't, if you can't complete the conspiracy, you do not spend an acolyte. So you just keep going. We're on convert again. Surprise, surprise. Same spot works. And now when we go to Crusade, we spend that, that lizard. We'll put it back in the supply. 
to actually crusade. So we have uh, we have one clearing, uh, number six. We have two lizards, um, and we are going to, in this case, we battle in all ordered clearings that meet that two or more lizard requirement. And then you look for the player with the most points there. So that is one where um, you will act, if you're in a clearing, you will target people who are lower down the victory point track. In this case, we're still in that clearing um, because lo and behold, convert targets the leading player. So more often than not, you're going to be crusading against the leading player as well. All right, so we got one and one. Obviously, buildings and tokens don't fight back, so we don't take any hits. And since they're undefended, we actually do two of those hits. So one, two, bonk, bonk. Um, that will trigger cost of errors, so we will remove the lowest uh, minister when we get rid of that building, but don't need to show you that here. Um, and then we go on to Sanctify. So Sanctify, in an ordered clearing, we replace an enemy building with a matching garden, which there are quite a few tasty options over here. Well, actually, there's just one <laughs> in, in eight. And the reason why there are so many foxes, I used a bunch of fox cards. Um, well, I used two. No, no, I, I did three because I crafted. Um, so I, as the rats, kind of seeded the lost souls with a lot of foxes. And then I'm here in fox clearings. But because I was way back here on victory point track, I'm pretty much safe. So again, Sanctify, we're going to look for the target player, which is still moles. And then we look for ordered clearings with buildings of that player, which there are none. So we can no longer... We can no longer um, uh, actually do anything there. So you go over to convert, can't do anything, go to crusade, no, convert, no, crusade, no, sanctify. So at this point, it just kind of goes in repeat, and I usually keep it at whatever was the first spot where it just couldn't do anything. Remember this last crusade was when we actually fought, couldn't do anything with sanctify, and this is just going to keep on going on loop. So we stop it at the first time when you can't do something. And then those acolytes stick around. You don't have to keep going until acolytes are gone. Those will just be included in next turn. All right, so that was Birdsong. A little bit more involved than most uh, Rootbot's Birdsongs. Now, for Daylight, you're going to reveal the top four cards. Now these are face up in here, so it's not that big of a you know reveal, but reveal is a verb in most games. So these uh, six cards are going to be discarded, but it doesn't say to do it yet. Um, so you reveal the top four, and what I do, I turn them upside down. And so as I do them, I flip them over and I put them behind because you need to maintain the order of these cards because they're going to go back on top of Lost Souls in the same order. Any open building slots in Fox, 8, 12, 6, 1. So we have all of the options. Um, however, the only one with enemy buildings is number 8. So as much, as it, as much sense as it doesn't make <laughs> that we already own 6, and if we put a single warrior down in one, we would own that as well. We're going to contest the site with, or the, the clearing with the building. So that's going to go behind. Bird, I'm going to just take a warrior from supply. Turn into an acolyte, and this gets immediately discarded does not go back into our lost souls. So another fox. We have two against two, but we have a, another fox here. So now we have three to their two. We're going to put down a fox garden. So the lizards super control eight, um, both in number, but also any clearing where you have a garden, you just control it. All right, so we go to evening. We're going to score victory points of the rightmost empty garden space. Now, before we had two uh, rabbit spots, but the alliance messed it up and 
revolted. So we actually have, just with these two gardens, they're only in the zero column, so we get nothing. Um, so womp womp. We're going to discard the remaining lost souls. So I guess the cards that I didn't reveal should have just went back to lost souls. I just kept them over here. Doesn't make a huge difference, but they're gonna go over there. And then return revealed cards to the top of the lost souls, preserving their previous order. Now with these ones, it doesn't matter a ton because they're all the same suit, um, but it's good to practice it nonetheless. And then last but not least, we are going to craft the top card if it is a craftable card it is you have some pancakes so we take those put them in our crafted items which might be targeted by the warlord we'll just have to see and then that goes on top of our lost souls and that is the lizards the logical lizards turn um so uh hopefully that clarifying um the conspiracies are definitely a kind of a tricky spot um, and it makes a big difference of whether you're targeting the clearing or the player first. So make sure, clearly says it right there, you always want to focus on the player so you're not uh, going to be beating up on the player who's way in the, in the you know, back of the pack. All right, so let's get back over there and talk about some cards. All right, we're back. Um, so now we will talk about the cards. Because remember, uh, the the board, just the the board as printed, is essentially normal mode for each of the root bots. Uh, we have our difficulty and our trait cards, which are the skill level and the player type. Uh, that's how I view them for the root bots. Uh, so if you want to make it easier, you have one option for that, or two options to make it harder, and then all of the traits will make it different. Most of them will make it harder. Um, not just strictly harder, like the difficulty cards, but th in the complexity of the trait cards, usually the more of them they had, and you can use all four if you'd like. With each one, it typically adds a little bit of difficulty to the bot. Um, but for right now, let's talk about easy. So when you perform rituals, reveal only three cards from your lost souls. So this is uh, a pretty, pretty smallish change. Definitely noticeable because this is the way that they typically send those 25 warriors. The lizards have a huge bag of warriors to, to you know, send out to the woodland. And typically um, those rituals are the biggest way that they get them out to, to converse with the people. So only doing three a turn instead of four, definitely slows things down a little bit. Um, for those who are uh, friends of the channel, who've been following along, you probably know for challenging, we're going to have the inverse. So for easy, we dropped ritual count by one. For challenging, we're going to up it by one. When you perform rituals, instead reveal five cards from your lost souls. So everything I just said, reverse it, and it makes it Yes, a little bit more challenging because they're just getting one more either free warrior or a free acolyte with which to do some converting and crusading and sanctifying later on. And then again, just like with all the nightmares, it's the same as challenging, but you also get an extra victory point at the end of evening. So you reveal five cards from Lost Souls each turn and a victory point at the end of Logical Lizard's tenure. Um, so those are the difficulty cards. Let's talk about the traits. As always, I'm going to go through these in order of my favorite to my least favorite. Um, just my personal preference. And I don't say this enough, but these are in no way uh, necessarily balanced against each other. From one card to the next, you may say, wow, that one sounds like it's going to be way more difficult which is definitely true. For all the factions, there's at least one trait that's either way more difficult or not as difficult as the other ones. And that's just, it is what it is. But they, they all definitely change the way the faction operates or the way you engage with them. So first up, Fanatics, my favorite of the four. Whenever you convert, battle in that clearing after converting the warrior. In this battle, deal an extra hit. 
uh, and then the player tie, target player with the most defenseless buildings, then the most points. So I think this is a ton of fun. Fanatics, it's just thematically, it's really, really cool. You convert someone and they are so filled with, you know, zeal that they just go right into battling. Um, but also mechanically, it's just nasty because you, you don't go necessarily after the player with the most points. You go after the player with the most defenseless buildings. Now, more often than not, those will coincide because you're converting the player's pieces who has the most victory points. So uh, in terms of who has the most defenseless buildings, my brain immediately goes to, well, probably the player, you just took a warrior away from them because maybe they thought that building was protected and now it's not. Um, but I think Fanatics is super fun because it, this is already a faction that just pops up everywhere and it's it's really you're playing whack-a-mole or whack-a-lizard i guess since there are moles in the game um and this just makes them have a little bit more like bite uh to to that that popping up and then potentially clamping down as well uh second martyrs whenever you perform a bird ritual also place a warrior from your supply into your acolytes box so this is probably why my brain made the goof in the example turn because I was preparing for the video and I prepared so much that I just prepared that part of my brain. Um, so you get the, the warrior coming off the map from the clearing with the most lizards, but then you also get a free one from supply. Um, it's kind of, it's kind of like, just like, I don't know. Like, like I always say, there's a break point between the, the the traits that I like and the traits I'm not as big a fan of, that break point is after Fanatics in this case. <laughs> These three I'm not as big a fan of. They definitely change the game, and the way this changes it is makes the Lizards have a lot more conspiracies. But my other like perennial complaint with traits is sometimes if it's tied to, say, a bird card, like this one is, that's fine and it can make for some pretty nasty turns or like the cats who double recruit on uh, escalated daylight turns however if you never draw a bird card or you never have a bird ritual th that's that's much less likely um but it's not impossible and that means you have a trait that's it's both like the threat of like ah that sounds no fun but also might never happen so i don't know just my thoughts. Erratic, third place. At the end of your turn, draw a card and add it to your lost souls. So exactly what it says on the package, it just makes the root bot more erratic. Um, you are just pulling cards off the top, so you can't count those cards and kind of influence what the, the uh, outcast suit is going to be nearly as much. Um, you never know what's going to sway the, those counts, but also by taking the card off the top of the deck, that's just one more way to prevent that card from getting into either the hands of any players or the cold, dead, poorly dexterous hands of the root bots. Um, you know, potentially removing uh, a craftable item from the next bot being able to do it or or uh, a player is really looking for insert card here and that card might just get ripped off the deck and put onto here for erratic uh the trait and you know like i said just like the package says the logical lizards become a little more illogical um last but least uh spiteful whenever you crusade score one extra victory point if you remove any tokens so it's fine. Um, it's fine. <laughs> and that's, it's fine. It sounds like something that uh, you would say when something's very much not fine. Um, but I don't know. It immediately comes to my mind. There are factions for whom you don't throw a ton of tokens around the board. Or they have them, but they don't use them very much. Um, so you might never actually get to use this. Uh, and yeah, it's just... This is one where it's it's not really like a gameplay change so much as it is just like a buff to the lizards. You just get an extra point for removing tokens. Spite I mean, I can see I can I can like anthropomorphize that name to this action, but I'm here to say it's not going to be nearly as like thematic 
and rich as fanatics. Every time that happens, I'm going to be like, whoa, these lizard robots are fanatical. Um, so that's uh, my ranking of the four traits. I think they're all they're all interesting. I, I shuffle them up, and I'm not going to lie. Sometimes I draw one that I really don't care for. I draw again. Um, but I think they're, it's always fun to at least have one trait in play. Um, I don't always throw challenging in there, but sometimes I do. But the, the trait cards, I think, are more often than not more fun than just playing the, the vanilla version of the faction. However, I would highly recommend for your first time playing any of the root bots, you just leave those trait cards off to the side, leave the difficulty cards off to the side. Um, I, I would say leave the, even the easy card off to the side and learn the board as is. You might lose, but you're at least going to learn what the normal, you know, natural version of the root bot is and then if you want to lower the difficulty then put in easy but i would say learn the board first and then start adding cards to it so with that um, we are uh, rounding out seven eighths of the currently published root bots uh, next up you guessed it and i've i've leaked it is going to be the otters the most complex of the root bots thus far um, and then in the hazy uh, distant future, or not so distant, I have no idea, uh, will be the first passes at Better Bot Project's version of the rats and the, um, the badgers. So you can bet that as soon as those are out, I will be learning and presenting you with how to play those print and play versions. And then way further down the road will be talks of Leader Games' official Clockwork 3 expansion, which is said to also come with rules for how to utilize the uh, uh, hirelings, which are amazing. Um, so I think that would be a really fun addition to the game, um, if somewhat challenging. Like, that'd be a lot of stuff to balance, but I'm excited to learn it and to try it out. Um, but until then, I've given you seven of these factions, so hopefully they're hitting your table. You're having a blast with them. I'll get you the eighth soonish, and I will see you whenever that happens. And until then, thanks for taking a pause with Give Pause. I'm Kyle, and I will see you next time.